the Teach for All conference, the global conference, has been a phenomenal experience. This is my very first in-person conference. How has it been for you? <laughs> and I think something that's been really incredible for me is to witness the emphasis and importance we've put on student leadership and how we've centered the, the voices and agency of students, especially on stage, on panels, and even in the conversations we have between sessions. And this is all well in response to the urgent and important need we all see to build a new movement of student leaders who can respond to, to uncertainties and also to the emerging changes in technology, in education, in climate, the future of work, and so much more. And for our panel today, we are going to be um, stepping up a bit from the conversations we've been having. We'll be looking at the practical shifts we can make to transform whole systems to develop students as leaders. Now, the, the, the promise of industrialization has always been to students and to young people and children, it has always been keep your head down, meet specification, get the best grade, and you will win in life. But that is all over now. The competitive advantage, as we all know, is leadership. It's about solving problems. It's about bringing a group of people together around uh, a shared vision. It's about creating connection and building trust with communities. It's about going out in the world and making meaning. But the question still remains, how do we transform our current systems to produce this vision of leadership of students? So my panelists, and also together with the audience, we're going to try to articulate some form of answers to this question. But first, let me invite our panelists to the stage. Our very first panelist has been described by The Guardian as fearless and revolutionary. She is a strong advocate for local communities. She led the localization movement in the World Humanitarian Summit that created this, what is now known as the Grand Bargain, 25% targets of funding going to um, local communities. She is the executive director of ADESO and the co-founder of the NIER Network, a, a network of organizations led by people in the global south, rethinking foreign aid and shifting power and communities to local communities. Please help me welcome Dagan Ali. Our second panelist is no stranger to system transformation. She has been a principal in a number of schools. She has recently led the fifth biggest economy in, in Africa, Lagos State, as commissioner for education. She is a co-founder of Teach for Nigeria and sits on the board of the Africa Leadership Academy. Please welcome Falasha Day Adefisaya. Our final panelist is a Teach for Uganda alum and a champion for collective leadership. He works in deep partnership with communities and schools to create access to quality education for kids, to develop their leadership potential, and also limit the barriers that hold them from fulfilling their potential. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Obore. <laughs> Welcome. We're going to be, as I've um, said, we're going to be answering the question of how can we transform systems to develop students as leaders. And Charles, I'm going to begin from you. As uh, an alum, as a leader who works in deep partnership with communities, what are some of the strategies and principles you have found that is most effective at shifting the systems to develop students as leaders. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's such an amazing day again for all of us to meet here. But permit me a little latitude that my great grandfathers may not be happy with me if I do not add my voice to the many voices that have welcomed you here in Africa. 
I want to say welcome to the continent of Africa. Such a great continent that has produced many great leaders that this world has ever had. Here where you seated is a continent where Nelson Mandela was born. Here where you are seated is where Kwame Nkrumah was born. Here where you are seated is where Jomo Kenyatta was born. And of course, there are quite many of our African leaders who went far beyond our continent to offer leadership. Here, where we are sitting, is where our grandson, Barack Obama, is seated. And please, it's such a great moment that we are seated here together to discuss about community leadership, a continent that has produced such great leaders. Now, when we talk of collective leadership, it is such a powerful conversation that, that, that should have happened many years ago. Because when you look at the mode of leadership that has been in place for years, it has been a kind of leadership that emphasizes on hierarchy, position, and power, and influence. That there will always be one person in charge of others, making decisions, and others have to follow. And trust me or not, the global complexity of issues right now in our world can never be trusted to one individual to make decisions. Which means we have to shift our thinking from that hierarchical mode of leadership to now what we call collective leadership. Can we be able to have communities joining hands together, sharing ideas and bringing different perspectives to be able to solve their community issues. That's what we call collective leadership. Is that possible here and anywhere in the world? Trust me or not, it is possible and it is even happening. I want to try and share some bit of history about myself and the Fellowship of Teach for Uganda and what we have been doing in the classrooms and outside classrooms as far as developing students as, as collective leaders is concerned. So in 2018, I was in the Teach for Uganda Fellowship and I was taken to a rural community school deep down in a village in, in central Uganda, a community that has neglected education and left the entire institution to only 40 children. Teachers had lost hope in the institution. Even the head teacher himself actually said, this school can no longer be a better place for anybody. Maybe somebody somewhere will come and solve us. We as new fellows moving into such a situation, we're confronted with a lot of issues. How then can we mobilize these communities to come back to entrust themselves that this school can actually change their lives? A hard task on us. When we talk of building collective leadership, then the nucleus of it all is actually building relationships and creating trust. Without relationships and creating trust, we can never create collective leadership. How did we maneuver this out? <laughs> so we enter into this community, parents are reluctant to come to the school to discuss with the parents, with the kids. The kids are also Few of them coming to school, others are out loitering in the community. So one day, I came up with an idea that you guys, seven of you are in my class. Where are others? They keep telling me, yeah, they are fishing. They are, they are somewhere playing down there in the village. So we, we sat together as a class that what can we do if we are to be able to attract other students to come back to school? And we came up with an amazing idea. I remember it was Women's Day. These kids told me, sir, can we move around the community? I'm like, wow, that could be a powerful idea. I'm like, okay, so moving around doing what? They're like, we can, we can dance, okay. We can write some messages and some placards. And we did that chap chap, wrote some messages on placards, please come back to school. We moved around the community singing, yeah, every child come back to school, every child come back to school. It was a funny thing that which kind of teacher is this? But of course we created an attention that everyone was curious that, okay, so this school is actually starting to become lively, that these kids are actually now starting to take leadership as their own, moving around the community to mobilize their own fellow students to come back to school. Trust me or not, by the time we finished our campaign, 
the next morning we received some parents in the school asking us what was happening. We told them new ideas are happening here and it's not we the teachers, it's actually the what? The kids. They are like, okay, I will also try and bring my kids here. So that kind of building relationships among the kids with the teachers, but also giving the students the power to build relations outside the classroom to the community is really a powerful thing of creating community leadership. By the time we completed our two years in fellowship in that school, we had raised the numbers from 40 students to 237. <laughs> Many times I tell myself that it's not Charles who did that, it is those students who did that. It is not only those students who did that, it is even those parents who really saw what was important about what those kids were doing that actually transformed that. Now, that is principle number one. Principle number two, we have to discuss on the area of sharing learning and decisions. We must share learning and at the same time share decisions. I am now an alumni and I run a community initiative that uses the power of football to keep girls at school. So when I was starting this initiative, I went to my community and told them, I have a ball here, girls, all of you come and play it. Everyone looked at me as like, what? Girls to play football, that has never happened before. So how can that happen? Really? So I trained my seven girls <laughs> the first week. Trust me, in the second week, nobody came for training. Information circulated all around the community that Charles is indoctrinating our girls to move half naked because they are putting on shorts to play football. I am like, what? <laughs> this is what is happening. I did enter to go and talk to one of the greatest church leaders in our community. I'm like, the church leader, this is the issue what is happening. Can it be possible for us to transform the education of these girls if you wish the power of football. This is my vision, this is my dream. I think that church leader actually got touched. He told me tomorrow we have prayers in church. Come, I will introduce you to the church so that you talk to the parents. I went on Sunday, talked to them, introduced me. And at the end of it, after I finished to speak, those parents told me, why didn't you come and talk to us earlier on? These are actually the ideas that we need. After the praying session, they asked me to have a separate meeting with them. Can we discuss now about your idea? These parents told me things that I thought were not important. They told me, Charles, if you are to make our girls play football, they must come to train after lunch because in the morning, they have to help us at home to cook food. Charles, if you are to help our girls in the game of football, you must make sure that they wear shorts only in the field not outside the field. I'm like, wow, this is really important. I sold my idea as well to them. And at the end of that meeting, those parents told me, we are going to entrust you with our girls and see what happens. What do we learn from that? It is important as leaders not to take power on ourselves. We have to learn from everyone. And at every time, Everyone has something to learn from you, and even you, you have something to teach the other person. And at the end of it, when you start learning from each and everyone around you, you will be able to come up with a conclusion of making decisions that actually work for everyone. When we finished to sit and had that conversation, we really realized that we were able to learn from one another. And we were able to make comprehensive decisions that actually helped our football academy. Those parents up to now do love the academy more than I even love the academy. As we speak right now from the seven kids that we started with, right now we have 162 girls participating in our football academy. It is not because, it is not because that I am the greatest leader, no. It is simply because of the idea of collective leadership, incorporating everyone, learning from one another, and allowing each and every person to make decisions. And that is why I have a little bit of problem with African mode of leadership. Here in Africa, decisions are made at top, and we from down have to listen and be followers. That can be the solution. We have to change that and make it become more collective where everyone is involved. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, 
fun fact is, while Charles was beginning his fellowship in Uganda in 2017, I was also starting mine at the same time in Nigeria in 2017, and I relate so much with everything you've shared. And something I found as well that for us to make change happen, we actually have to bring down the walls of the classroom to let the community in, let the parents in, the pastors, and also the government officials as well who often come around. And now moving um, from that to the, the notion of government here, um, Mr. Defisayo, you have um, a very extensive experience there. You led one of Africa's biggest cities, one of Africa's biggest economy, um, through the COVID crisis as Commissioner of Education. What have you learned about bringing collective efforts together in and outside government to, to shape systems, to change systems towards that vision of student agency? Thank you very much for the question, and I must greet everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, this is a very serious question indeed, because just like, sorry, Charles, Charles. right? So just like Charles said, the, there must be change from the bottom. But like he said at the end, there must be change from the top as well. I'm very lucky in that I have worked at the bottom and at the top. So as a school principal, one thing that I was very clear about was that the students would lead the school. My teachers didn't like it most of the time, but I never would do things like take assembly. We would have, you know, the whole culture and ethos of the school just centered around turning our students into leaders so that it's not just passing exams. A lot of people pass exams, and that's my belief as an educationist. But to come out of it as a leader, that's a totally different thing. So we ensure that a lot of the processes in school were led by the students. For instance, after break time, you were not supposed to take food beyond a certain point to the classroom. But you know students always know where to hide food. So what we do is the prefects just used to sit around. And whereas teachers would say, OK, go, the prefect would say, lift up your trousers. And under it, in his socks, would be like a lollipop or something. You know, so they knew where everything was. They know themselves. They, they can manage themselves. You just facilitate the process and support them. So when I came into government, uh, this was uh, thought to be a very strange idea. And it was difficult initially, but then something happened. And that's something that happened, happened to the whole world. And that was a terrible incident of COVID, where we had to close down our schools. We really had to. So all fancy ideas just had to come to a halt. Now what do we do? Because these were public school children that I was in charge of, and most of them had no access to data, to devices, online learning, whereas the children in the private schools, everybody said, oh, it doesn't matter. We just move school you know, online. <laughs> now what are we going to do? And this is where I think the power of community comes in. So we went online, we talked to a lot of people. I used all the contacts I had, all the friends I had, I bothered them, and we started online school for the public school children. We started on the simplest form of technology, which was radio. To our deep surprise, to mine anyway, I found that there are many children who had no access whatsoever to radio, just radio. So I, got my, I was the first donor. So I donated my salary for a couple of months to buy radios. So I now called my staff. I've donated. Now you start donating. Every friend who called me on phone, well, how many radios are you going to buy for me? So I think some people stopped calling me, actually. But uh, I was OK. I got the radios in. Then some banks heard and joined us and said, OK, we're going to take it a step higher. We're going to buy them devices. And so we worked with the corporate community, they started donating. We had devices to the tune of, I don't know how many billions of Naira, or how many hundred, uh, how many dollars, but it was quite a lot, it was quite significant. We had about uh, a million children in public, uh, sec public schools, uh, so we needed a million devices, which we didn't get, but we got a significant proportion of that. And we gave it out to children in the far off rural communities. So the next thing was, okay, now they have the devices. How are we going to teach them? Just, we just used what we used with radio in that we got radio stations who gave us free airtime. And so we were able to do that to 
uh, record a lot of our lessons. So we recorded the lessons on radio, but of course they were available on YouTube, they were available on uh, a number of uh, portals. We got IT companies to donate their portals to us. We had a whole portal where you could go on, there were quizzes, there were tests, there were videos. I mean, for children who had never seen a device before, it went all over, especially the rural communities, because we found that in town, even if they can't have, uh, have access to their own device, they would have a sister or a brother or a cousin who could sp uh, share, who could, uh, you know, spare like 10, uh, like 30 minutes or 50 minutes of the uh, airtime for them. And so this went on throughout um, COVID. And the teachers, as for the teachers, what did they do? They were magnificent. Uh, some of the teachers started teaching on as simple a device as WhatsApp. I didn't know you could teach on WhatsApp. But they had lessons on WhatsApp, some had lessons on Telegraph, some, there was one every morning she would put her board on two chairs in her sitting room and start teaching. I learned from her too. She was a very good math teacher, which is rare anyway. So, it, this now, you know, what happened was that the whole community was now galvanized. I will admit that some people thought this was an impossibility, but it was doable. And then we now had to take to the next level that how are the students going to become part of this so that they are not just passive listeners, just listening to lessons. And that's when we started to think about things like working with communities, like the kings in communities, giving them worksheets so that students were giving out the worksheets on market days. Because even during COVID, we opened on market days, maybe one day a week for people to go to the market. And so they exchanged uh, worksheets and so on there. And so that was done, all done during COVID. And uh, then we had helplines because the children were severely traumatized, as you can imagine, uh, staying at home with nobody to look after them. And uh, we had helplines. People gave us, people donated lines. So what I'm trying to say is that the way, the, what you can do with whole scale transformation, there's not something government can do by itself, clearly. Because uh, first of all, in government, government is built a certain way. When I entered, I'd never seen such things in my life because uh, it was so bureaucratic, it was so difficult to make the change. But I found that by appealing to the teachers, to the principals, to the children themselves, eventually to the community, we were able to drive the change from the grassroots, as we say in Nigeria, drive the change so that eventually the people at the top saw that this is serious, we can do this. And uh, so I think for large scale transformation, again, I would just like to summarize by saying, you just have to approach it from both ends. You have the granular one, you have the classroom one, what is happening in the classroom. That is great, that is important. What's happening in school, what's happening in communities with parents and everybody. Then you really have to get to the top because if they don't provide the funding, they don't provide the support, you are not really going to succeed. So I think it was just, uh, I, after COVID is another story, but during COVID was a magnificent example of how to galvanize the whole community towards learning. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's really interesting to that comment on how we should approach change, transforming the system from both ends, both from the top and also from the grassroots. This actually reminds me, I have a friend also a Teach for Nigeria alumna who is actually here with us, who while you were leading this change, she was also trying to, to create a free school for kids in her community. Uh, I think, Aramide, are you here? Wave your hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Aramide, you've been listening to this conversation so far. I would love to ask you, what has resonated with you? And from your experience, also trying to shift systems within your own context to develop students as leaders, what can you also add to this conversation? I wrote in my notepad here, when Charles was speaking, that a school can change the world, an intentional school can change the community. And you know, when Charles mentioned about how important it is to create relationships and trust in the community, um, I think about it in the school that I run in a rural community in Nigeria. 
And my school, Talent Mine Academy, is a free school. We provide 12 years long education to children in under-resourced communities who would never have had the opportunities to go to school at all. And um, at the school, our mission and our main focus, the major reason why we're existing is so that we can raise these children in low-income communities right in the center of the community to solve the problems that their communities are facing. So we are not taking them out of the community, but we're raising them there. And I'll just quickly highlight a very interesting story of how important um, it is to empower these children because they can actually solve problems in the grassroots. I recall a story of Donald. Um, Donald is one of our kids. Right now, he's in primary two, and he's just nine years old. And last year, Donald realized that there were children in the communities that were losing their parents. Um, they were losing their siblings, and that was because people were dying. Um, there were drivers who were driving recklessly in the community, and a lot of people were dying. And Donald felt so bad because um, he had his parents, but he also had friends who, were, who had now become orphans because of that experience. So what Donald did was that he gathered together some of his friends, some of which had lost their parents, uh, but some of them who were also as pained as he was. And they got together in the community, they got cardboards, and they went around the community advocating for safe driving. And in those cardboards, they wrote, please drive safely, be mindful of road users. On some cardboards, they wrote, we are losing our parents, we are losing our friends, we are losing our siblings, please do something about it, drive safely. And they went around the community advocating for safe driving. And I mean, they got to a bar. At that bar, there were a lot of drunk drivers. And they told them, I mean, they continued the advocacy there. And one of the drunk drivers said, wow, if the children are now talking about it, then it is really a terrible problem. And before we knew it, in the community, there's a big junction and roundabout there. We started seeing traffic wardens there. And it was because a nine-year-old boy stood up and said, people are dying because you're driving recklessly. And because of that, there was a change in the community. And how did we get here, right? How did we get to the point where a child who is nine years old from a low-income community, who has the potential to have low self-esteem and feel inferior and feel like, who am I to create this kind of change in my community? How do we get to the point where that child can now boldly advocate and even call his colleagues together we got there by giving them voice, by embracing their voice, and letting them know that because you're from this community does not mean that you can't do something about the problems that are there. And it doesn't mean that you're disadvantaged. But because you're right in the middle of the community, you can actually do something about it. So we first of all changed their mindsets, and then we now started to empower them with the life skills, mentorship, and the exposure that they needed to now start thinking on a higher level of solving the problems that their communities face. And then we now started giving them opportunities to step up. Opportunities like Student Leadership Council, we have a school leadership council, and we have student representatives in there. We are hiring teachers. We want to get your opinion on this teacher. Right, should we hire this teacher? We're having school feedback. We want to get your opinion. How are we doing? Give us feedback. And every single time we have opportunity to make decisions at this, as a school, we have to, we work with the children and then we get their opinions to know what are the things that we need to do. And of course, just as Mrs. Solasha did mention, assembly, <laughs> our kids undo it completely. And so these leadership opportunities, and of course, combined with the mindset change and the life skills empowerment that these children have access to, I think that there are things that every school should replicate. And for every teacher, uh, every school leader here, one thing that I think is very important to um, that you can practice in your school to ensure that student leadership is embracing the voices of the children, allowing for student agency. Because Charles mentioned that the kids came to meet him and they're like, let's go to the community. And you see that it was because Charles listened and embraced their voices, they were able to grow the number of children in the school from 40 to over 200. So that's what I'll share. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, contribution. And I think examples like Aramides um, gives us a picture of possibility of how schools and educators can create the structure, the scaffolding and environment for students to have that first step to imagine a better world for themselves and also for all of us. I would love to hear like more comments on that, but I want to also hear from, from Dagan. Um, let's zoom out a bit, right? 
you have um, you're a strong advocate for community for community voices, and you have um, you're a leader in the localization uh, mo movement. And I want you to share with us what are some of the first steps we need to take to change systems, to transform systems, to leverage and prioritize the voices and power of communities? Yeah. Um, so first, Bismillah. Um, good morning and uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, hearing Ruth read that poem really moved me to tears, honestly. And I was moved by the fact that there's so many other children who don't have the benefit of Jacqueline as a teacher or Henry as a teacher. And I was thinking about, if we're talking about systems, the systems change is how do we make sure that all the roofs in that school have access to that kind of environment that really allows them to realize their potential. Instead of just, you know, what Teach for All, the model, it, um, I think, is, is an amazing, impactful model. We saw that. We see that every single day. You guys are a great example of that. But I think to go to the next level and to talk about the system, we need to talk about why is it that the schools need these fellows and they're so transformative? Why is it that all the other teachers are not having that level of impact? And this is where I zoom out and I talk about the global systems issue and um, why are we in the state that we're in as global south countries or African countries where we can't even resource our education systems properly? Um, you know, post-colonialism, a lot of our African governments had really progressive policies around education and services for their citizens. I'll give you a great example, Malawi. Malawi had um, really progressive policies to support their farmers. Just like Americans and Europeans subsidized their farmers, they said we need to do the same thing and subsidize our farmers. And then they also had an emergency reserve um, in their budget. So from droughts or crisis happens. What happens, fast forward years later, the World Bank and the IMF comes and says, if you wanna get a loan from us, you have to remove all your subsidies to your farmers. And you cannot subsidize anything. And then, now, a drought happens. Fast forward years later, a drought happens. The same IMF and World Bank who are calling the shots in these poor countries, putting these crazy structural adjustment programs, SAPs, we've heard about the horror of the 80s and 90s and what they've done to Africa and the global south in general. Now these same countries come fly in with UNICEF or Save the Children or these big INGOs running malnutrition programs, hunger programs <laughs> in Malawi. The government could have taken care of their citizens if they had had the policies that were destroyed by the West. We don't control the IMF and the World Bank. They're controlled by the West, by the former colonizers and imperialists. The same structural adjustment programs also had impact on the education system. That's why we don't have a thriving scholars programs at universities. Those were funded by governments. We were talking about that the other night with Leslie, my American board member, and Sarah Kenyon. So we have had those programs. We say, oh, why doesn't Africa do this? Or why doesn't Africa do that? Well, we did, and you destroyed it. Right now, in Kenya, right now, it's such a sad thing to say that all the schools in Kenya used to provide free sanitary pads to girls as the way to keep them in schools. I don't know if you know, you guys shouldn't be surprised, but there are girls who are literally selling their bodies in Kibera and other slums in Kenya just to get access to sanitary pads. 15-year-old girls who are selling themselves, prostituting themselves, just to get access. So what did this new government do? As part of another way to pay back debt to the IMF and the World Bank and uh, balance their books, they removed all sanitary pads in the schools. 
And then tomorrow, the same donors will come to us and lecture us why girls are not, enrollment rates have gone down. They will lecture us and say, why are girls not getting educated? We need to focus on girl-child education. We need to focus on this. You're not supporting girl children. But you just made us remove this from our budget. So we need to understand we are so-called free, but we're not really free. We're not independent, sovereign nations that control our economies and the political systems. We are controlled by others. And our governments that we have, yes, to scale this model of teach for all, the heart of it, you don't need, I was telling Henry, a child, opportunities and potential are realized by a great teacher. Not the classroom, not the physical structure. You can sit under a tree and teach a child. Under a tree, we do that. But what do we have? We have an archaic colonial education system from the British or the French in Francophone countries. The curriculums have rarely been updated. We are told to dress your children in these school uniforms that are expensive, most can't afford, that replicate the model of the British children. And we're told that your teacher training colleges have to be this way or this way. And that that's why the, the teachers are replicating what was done to them and what the governments and the policies and all of that. That's why it's all about rote memorization. It's not about critical thinking. It's about passing exams and tests. It's not about critical thinking and problem solving and leadership. It's not about that. The system is not designed to produce that. And in a way, our governments want people who don't have critical thinking so they can continue being corrupt and doing what they want. It benefits them. So it's a, it's a, uh, a system that feeds on itself, that feeds on its own corruption, that feeds on this colonial project that is still there. So we need to understand it's not uh, this, this lecturing that constantly the global north talks about. It's one of the things that gets me so angry. You're corrupt. You don't have good governance. You don't have democracy. Every single institution that the West has developed has been undemocratic. Look at the UN. Five countries have veto power. That's why we can't solve Israel and Palestine. It's not one country, one vote. Every single institution that has been developed by them has been undemocratic. The World Bank and IMF, voting power is based on GDP. They did that on purpose because they know that we don't have the money that they do. It's not every single country has the same power. So you lecture to us about democracy and good governance, but every single thing that you do is undemocratic and unjust. Thank you so much. Um, I want to ask uh, you like a quick follow-up question there. And our opening plenary um, was framed around um, developing students as Ubuntu leaders, right? And, and I, I think that framing presupposes that there is something there in, in our culture, in our way of life, that already talks about student leadership. How do you think we can reconnect with those authentic cultural expressions to change our systems and, and prioritize leadership and agency of students and children? I actually think, uh, um, I come from Somalia, where pastoral communities, I don't know if you know what pastoralists are known for, everywhere in the world. There are certain, <laughs> yes, I see <laughs> my fellow Somali sitting in the front. Um, we're known for being prideful, we're known for being uh, warriors. We're known for being um, disobedient to the government. We are known for all of these things, right? Let me just tell you that the child I find, a pastoralist child in Somalia, that we put in into a school system who has never been in the city, has never been, in my opinion, indoctrinated by the mainstream education system, is much better leader, much better leader than the child that's city child. We actually have 
proverbs in Somali about city children and pastoral children, where we used to look down upon city children because they were so passive. They were just yes people. And so what I'm trying to say is we have to really think about what is it that we're actually trying to achieve in our curriculums and our education systems. Is it designed to really produce leadership that questions power and authority? Or is it designed to create robots who just accept everything that is handed down to them? You see? So this idea that education and leadership is produced because you've passed all types of exams and gotten A's, one of the things that hurts me as a leader of an organization, I've hired so many Kenyans over the years, and it pains me because I hire somebody who has a beautiful CV, has a PhD, and they come into my organization, and they sound great, they're very articulate, and then I put them in a position and they cannot problem solve. They cannot do critical thinking. They need to be spoon-fed. And I'm like, half of your life you've been in, in schooling, in education, and you, ha you need me to micromanage you? So this is, there is a serious problem with the entire whole notion of what education means. Yeah? And we need to revisit that. And this is where I feel Teach for All has the power uh, an opportunity to really do some serious influencing on our policymakers. You guys have a real phenomenal power as a global community. You could do a lot to influence the Nigerian government, the Kenyan government, and all these governments. Thank you. Um, we have a student from Peru, Ana Sofia, who would. Um So, Anna, I, I want to ask you this question. What specific changes would you advocate for in both your school and your community to prioritize the leadership and agency of students like yourself? Thank you for the question. So, I am Anna Sofia. I'm a member of the Student Leader Advisory Council and also from Enseña Peru. So, regarding the question. <laughs> Regarding the question, I would advocate for, first of all, um, having this space in schools and communities where the students are able to discover their own purpose with education. So in this way, this would also help with their motivation in learning, since learning is a long journey. It doesn't really end at school. It's always uh, continuing. So in order to do that, it would like, be a space for them to, to discover um, more about themselves and also how education can be a way in which they are able to um, achieve their dreams and be able to encourage their, their identity and go along with them. So that would be my first thing. Second of all, I would say that um, having these opportunities for students to take ownership in the schools and communities where they are able to, um, to have more participation opportunities where they are not the ones being asked the questions, but the ones asking the questions to other people are having more participation. And thirdly, I will say something that's also related to the second point, is the applying of learning, since like, the school might be like a little place for students, but then when we show them the real world, there's so much to do. So by applying the learning that we get in schools, they can also apply in their communities, and maybe they are able to you know, maybe solve some problems in these communities and uh, develop their entrepreneurial skills since we live in such a uh, competitive world, so that's something that we need to uh, know about since uh, entrepreneurship skills are all about problem solving. And lastly, but not least, is about addressing more about mental health and well-being. So building a place where students are not ashamed to show their humanity side and also uh, for students to be able to learn about vulnerability since I believe it's like a really powerful tool uh, to build community trust amongst all. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, that was um, really uh, beautiful to hear. And I would love to, everything you've said, I would love to push that to Charles and say, Charles, if you've heard her, she talked about 
a space to discover about um, themselves, students taking ownership, students solving problems and prioritizing their well-being. In a minute or two, how would you go about making this, shifting the system to make that happen? She's just amazing. We need to give her a round of applause. She's amazing. Yes, I'm, I'm going to move to her. You can get her this. When, when I joined my Teach for Uganda school, we had a head girl. And uh, the first time I asked her that what is her role as a head girl, she told me is to be a head girl. That's her role. Just be a head girl. And the other day when we had a conversation from here, there was uh, a little girl who said that she's a head girl. And when we asked her what challenges she faces, I remember her saying that she's overwhelmed by work. And I think that was powerful for me. We must give these students an opportunity to be overwhelmed by work. We must give them. Let's not micromanage what we call leadership in students. We call her head girl, head boy. But in actual sense, we are not giving these students an opportunity to explore their talents and try out their leadership opportunities. So she's amazing. I tell you an example. I have a football academy. Quick one. Football academy. We had a friendly match with my girls' team. And I'm always a very strict coach, like any coach would be. So we lost 9-0 in the first half. Nine goals to zero, I got frustrated. All my girls were frustrated. I say, what do I do? I told myself one thing, let me try and go away and watch what these girls will try and do. I moved the distance away and I was shocked that they changed their playing formation. They removed some players and brought in new ones. And by the time I came back, they had scored one goal. That's good. And trust me, that is the goal that we celebrated ever. And I want to sum what she said, that we as leaders, as we are developing collective leadership, there is one thing that we need to, to know as we are developing these students. Let's learn to go to where there are people, work with the people, create solutions with the people, such that at the end, these people will say, we have done it ourselves. Thank you so much, Charles. And I would love to also give the stage to. Thank you very much. Um, that educationist, um, that person in the room who says, uh, and this is one of the mantras I live by, so what? Now what? It's bad. It's colonial. It's not our system. It's not our way. But what are we going to do about it? And I'm one of those, and I took it from a YouTube video from someone who gave her three mantras. So it's not original to me, but I live by it. And I think that's one of the things we try to do in Lagos State. That look, look at this curriculum. It's been handed over to us. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. So we had lots of meetings, lots of discussions, and we spent about two years re, re, you know, revamping that curriculum so that we built into it critical thinking, problem solving. I'm an educationist. I don't, there's no subject that I like to call critical thinking. Weave it, integrate it, teach it in the classroom. Collaboration is the way you teach, is the way they learn, is the way you assess that learning has taken place. Is the culture, is the ethos of the classroom. And this is what we really focused on. And that's why I'm very, very excited about Teach for Nigeria and other organizations that I work with that focus on leadership. And as a former principal myself, that when you do this, the students take over. I worked in government, yes, but I strongly believe that the change normally will come from the teachers and from the classroom. And that's why I'm very, very excited about Teach for Nigeria. Because every school you go to and you ask the head teacher, who is your best teacher? You say this rather strange person who is doing all sorts of things in my school. Because they are making my children think differently. The culture of the school has changed. Things like bad behavior and so on have changed. And my children are now more interested in their lives, in their environment, in what is going on. So like I said, I'm not one of those up there people, but I know that we just have to accept and say, look, I'm in this situation. So what? And this is what I live with all of us. So what? So it's so bad. Now what are you as an individual going to do about it so that you leave the place better than you found it. Thank you. Thank you so 
much. I, we, can, we can have these conversations on and on again for three days straight, but I would love to open up, up questions to um, the audience. If you have um, a question, please um, raise your hand. But I would also love to share uh, this um, framework that Degen and Howe Organization has um, created it on, about decolonizing child and youth philanthropy, but you can um, meet, walk up with her, to her to um, ask more about this. Um, okay, if you have questions, please. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I am Ivan Samuel Womala from Teach for Uganda. Now I reside belong to Africa. Thank you to the amazing uh, panel, but uh, our educator from Somalia reflected on something so crucial. And I want to challenge everyone in this room today. The best way we can build collective leadership is to connect the dots between what we're showing learners on the blackboard and how it connects to their day-to-day -day lives. I am so passionate, a climate activist, I would say. But what is one plus one to a learner who has not eaten and they're worried of going home when it's raining and it would flood and they don't know that they'll, they'll come back to school the next day? Who is a learner who has learned about acres, kilometers, and they can't be able to know the measurement of how many kilograms of maize that their father can plant on an acre of land. And I want to challenge us that these learners know a lot of things, but we are also teachers in this room that are just attending this conference, and when you go back as an educator, you command in your class. Actually, when you don't come to school, your learners celebrate. Why? Because you're the boss. What you say is right, and nobody should say otherwise. We are stepping on people who we could actually learn a lot from. I have learned a lot from children, things I didn't know about. We have seen very many young people doing great things here, and all of us are clapping. But how sure are we that they're just, not, they are just giving us 5% of what they are made of? It's only when you open up their eyes and give them the opportunity that they give you. Lastly, I want to challenge us that, okay, I'm speaking this as someone so passionate about climate, and I want to start this state with this statement. There is no education, there is no leadership with climate, without climate education. Because everything we do here, we do it under the sun. And if you don't protect the planet, we can love digital learning. We can love girl empowerment. But the moment we don't teach learners to know that, before you jump in the compound, make sure that your roof is safe, we are not safe. I have ever spoken for a living, and if I hold this mic, we may not live here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess that's more a comment than a question. But I want to take one last question. If you have a question, just go direct to that question. Yes. I wanted to thank the panelists for having uh, what I like to call crucial conversations. Uh, as a professor from the United States that teaches unpacking whiteness, I have teachers who ask me who are Caucasian, um, why are we having this discussion? Because in the United States, there is this whole thing about we can't discuss critical race theory, we cannot discuss this, but thank you for having the courage to speak the truth as to what this is about. It's allowing and empowering individuals to find their own source of power from within to change their community. We saw that in Icabera yesterday with Kennedy School, so thank you for that. It's not about laying down the blame of the past, but it's trusting, and that's what Teach for All does, is trusting each other to let go of past biases so that we can celebrate the differences and learn from each other. So thank you for that. And I would ask all teachers from Africa, stand up so we can recognize you for hosting us and giving us a different perspective that's not through the stereotypes that we put Africa in. And I want to apologize on behalf of those that have put you in those stereotypes, but stand up so you could be recognized, please. All teachers from Africa.
Thank you so much. And we've come to the end of our session. We can, I, my, the panelists want to actually stay and have further discussion, but time is not on our side. And if there is one thing I'm taking out of this conversation today is the power of collective leadership to shift systems and to make um, the difference we want to see in, uh, in the leadership of students and young people in our classrooms and communities. Thank you so much again to our wonderful panelists.